Okay, uh, we'll get started. So, welcome to this class EP 5555, Securing Autonomous Systems. So uh, this particular class is about designing algorithms for autonomous systems. Now autonomous systems, I know many of you might think about autonomous vehicles, but it turns out that there are many, many autonomous systems uh, all around us. So this building has an energy management system, which is running the air conditioning system for this building. Every room has a thermostat, you can see the thermostat in the back of the room. That thermostat is measuring the temperature of this room, figuring out if the room is too hot or too cold. If it is too cold, it stops the air handling unit to send cold air into this room. If it's too hot, it starts sending uh, signals to the air handling unit to start sending a lot of cold air into this room. So that's an example of an autonomous system. Now, of course, if you look at it from the point of view of only this room, it's not that complicated. If you look at it from the point of this building, it's somewhat complicated. If you view it from the point of view of this university, which has 400 buildings scattered all over Columbus, and there are 400 air conditioning units, uh, and maybe 4,000 air handling units, uh, maybe even more, maybe 10,000 air handling units sending cold air to tens of thousands of rooms across the university you realize that it's actually a very, very complicated autonomous system. All of this information gets gathered, uh, the actuation signals are sent, all of that is done without any human intervention. There's no human in the loop, which is deciding whether to send cold air into this room or not. It's all being done completely autonomously by the logic that is embedded within these thermostats. You can look at the medical equipment. Uh, you know, there are lots of, med if you go to an ICU uh, intensive care unit, you will find a lot of different medical equipment that are continuously sensing the signals coming out of the human body and figuring out what drugs to inject, how much drugs to inject, um, any alarms that needs to be uh, sent to the nurses, to the doctors and so on. Um, and any other interventions that are needed from a medical perspective. So all of that is being done again completely autonomously in many cases. Of course, the doctors and the nurses are there to make critical decisions about the patient. But if you look at all the alarms, the signals, the drug injection that is auto automatically being uh, sent to the patient, all of that is uh, quite autonomous in the case of an ICU. So if you look at medical equipment, you look at uh, building energy management, you look at autonomous vehicles, all of these are autonomous systems because there is sensing, there is control loop, and there is uh, feedback. So the sensor sends information to the controller and the controller makes some decisions. All of this is done without any human intervention. So that's what we mean by autonomous system. And the goal of this particular course is as we have more and more autonomous systems, as we have more and more connectivity, all of these systems become vulnerable to cyber attacks. And we need to do two things. The first is how do you detect if there is an attack happening on that system or not? And once you've detected that there is an attack happening on the system, how do you design the control policy or the control laws to make sure that the system functions as intended? Now, of course, under attack, the intention of how the system should behave might change. Uh, but nonetheless, you need to figure out, you need to identify how should the system behave without attack, with an attack, and if with an attack the system is need, needs to behave in a certain fashion, then we need to make sure that the control logic is written in a way that makes sure that it, it satisfies those logic, those constraints. So that's what we are going to study in this particular class. Uh, there is an online component to this class. Uh, so this is the in-person component. Uh, I'm, Expecting about 15 people to join this class, but I don't see those many in the classroom. Uh, I'm not sure if people are going to drop it, drop uh, these, this class or not. But anyways, I'm expecting about 15 percent people to take it in person, and about five people would be taking it online, uh, or maybe six people are taking it online. So the online section is going to be asynchronous. That's a completely different section, by the way. It's for people who are not within Ohio State, so people who are in industry. So those are the six people who are taking this class in an asynchronous mode. 
So all the lectures will be recorded and uh, generally my, uh, what I generally do is I post all my lectures to YouTube so that way you will have access to the lectures even 40 years after you graduate from Ohio State if you need that information at that time. So anyways, I'll post everything, all of these videos on YouTube. So if you're missing the class, you are, feel free to go back to the YouTube channel and just watch the videos from there. Um, the prerequisites are 3050, which is signal system, and 30, 3551, sorry, not 3351, 3551, which is a, a feedback control system. So have, have, you, have, have you guys taken any feedback control systems class before? No? Uh, are you a graduate student or? Yeah. Okay. I've been in 3050. Okay. Not 3551. What about you? Yeah, You've taken feedback controls. Feedback controls. Okay. Uh, so we will be covering a little bit about feedback controls, but I, uh, uh, but you will have to spend a little bit more time to understand some of the basics of feedback control system so that you can follow the subsequent lectures. Um, the goal, the, the, the point is that if you're a graduate student and you are taking this class, uh, it's quite likely that you've seen some autonomous system somewhere and that's why you are taking this class. And therefore, you will have some knowledge of 3551 about how controllers are designed, how do you implement those controllers. And so if you don't have that prior knowledge, you might struggle in this particular class. Uh, just wanted to make that. Yeah. Uh, we will be using MATLAB extensively for our uh, for our assignment, so some familiarity with MATLAB is required. In particular, we require you to be familiar with MATLAB simulating because a lot of these complex systems, we can only do simulations in simulating because there are ready made models for complicated systems and simulating. So, there are three assignments, and all three of them will require uh, simulating uh, knowledge of MATLAB simulating for being able to complete the assignment. Uh, we will be covering a little bit of linear algebra. In the, in the class, but certainly a working knowledge of linear algebra will be required for this particular course. Okay, uh, office hours will be Friday 11 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. in DL464, that's my office. Uh, or you can also send me an uh, email and I'll uh, get back to you with a time when uh, we can chat uh, in my office. Uh, there are three homeworks, three online time quizzes, this is one hour quizzes. Uh, one individual project presentation, which is 10% of the grade. Uh, the project presentation, so generally what I advise students to do is you might be looking at some specific company that you want to get a job in. Uh, I think you should make sure that the project presentation is focusing on that particular sector. So if you want to go work for Honeywell, you want to work on a building energy management system, attack detection and attack mitigation project. And what I would expect you to do is either you read up a bunch of papers and try to understand what are the different cyber attacks and different techniques for solving those cyber attacks are uh, on that specific system. Or alternatively, you can also try to model something in simulate, come up with an attack detection strategy and come up with an attack mitigation strategy and show in the simulate diagram or simulate video that whatever algorithms you've come up with actually works for that particular system. Uh, I will require you to have some uh, deadlines for figuring out what the topic is and uh, what you want to do in the project. All of that deadlines will be communicated in due course. But uh, the presentation will be done in the final two classes. So that way you will get a chance to present whatever work you've done in, the, in front of the class and uh, also gain some hands-on experience on the field that you really care about and you want a job in. Um, the grades will be served at the end of the course uh, for assigning letter grades. And how many undergrads are there in this class? Any undergrads? No? Okay, okay. So, but the curve for the undergrads will be different from those of grad students. Uh, homework policy, everybody needs to work on the homework on their own. Uh, copying somebody else's homework is strictly prohibited. Um, there is no final exam, so project presentation is the only final exam you will have. And uh, that will be 10 minutes long, so depending on if we have 15 or 20 people in the class, the total presentation time will be 150 minutes or so. 
So about two, two and a half hours of presentation. Um, right. Any questions on the on the assignment policy? No? Perfect. So we have essentially three objectives here. Uh, the first one is understand how to model cyber attacks on engineering systems as mathematical problems. Then we need to learn optimization and statistical techniques for attack detection and then response schemes for countering the attacks on engineering systems. Uh, I'm not going to be covering any proofs or any math. Like we won't be covering significant math in the class. So. Uh, if you're interested in any of the mathematical underpinnings of whatever we are talking about, definitely meet me after the class and I'll point you to appropriate references. Um, so this is broadly the uh, outline for the course. Uh, we'll start with uh, linear algebra and calculus, then we'll talk about nonlinear optimization as applied to designing control strategies and feedback control systems. Then we'll talk about statistics and hypothesis testing. <coughs> Then we'll uh, talk about architecture for control architecture for large scale systems and attack detection and response strategies. Uh, uh, right, so for the project, I've given you some thoughts on how do you want to think about the project, but if you have any questions, feel free to uh, come to me and we can bring some together on the project topic. Uh, there is no official text for this class, uh, but uh, I, I do want to mention this particular book, Cybersecurity Analytics. It's a good book. I think it covers a lot of important topics around algorithms for attack detection. Uh, not quite on mitigation, because mitigation is very, very system specific. So whatever response strategies we will talk about will be very, very system specific. Like there is a specific system, there is a specific model. There's a specific cyber attack. This is how we will respond to that particular cyber attack. So that's how we'll be uh, talking about response. Detection is a bit more broader. So you will have like a whole bunch of tools. You can apply those tools anywhere for attack detection. But response is very, very uh, problem statement specific. If you are interested in autonomous vehicles, I would also encourage, in security of autonomous vehicles, I would also encourage you to have this book, uh, The Car Hacker's Handbook. It talks about penetration testing of uh, vehicles. And uh, this is written by uh, people who have extensive knowledge of, uh, they, they have extensive knowledge of how to do it in practice. So, of course, in universities, we don't actually practice attack detection or attack mitigation because uh, we don't get to see the actual system. In fact, uh, you know, when I go to industry and I tell them, look, I work in cybersecurity, you have any problem? And they say, no, we don't have any problems in cybersecurity. And the problem is that no industry will openly admit that they have problems with cybersecurity. And that's an unfortunate reality that, uh, um, that we as academy, uh, academicians will never get to know what are the different problems in different industries. We can only imagine. And based on our imagination, we can come up with algorithms. But whether those algorithms will actually be impactful or not on the ground, we will never know because all companies, all industries are uh, completely closed about any vulnerabilities they have found within their systems. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, any questions so far? No? Perfect. Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much it. So I present, uh, I've uh, created a small presentation uh, so that uh, we kind of set the stage for this particular class. I know some of the stuff we've already talked about. Uh, these are the topics. Uh, we'll talk about linear algebra and calculus. And after that, we'll talk about feedback and rule system. This is sort of a review of EC 3551. Uh, and then we'll talk about nonlinear optimization and dynamic programming, particular model predictive control, which is uh, used for, again, designing control strategies in complicated systems, complex systems. Then we'll talk about statistics and hypothesis testing, and then we'll talk about Markov disease and problems. Once we have studied all of these prerequisites, which will take about a month and a half to two months, 
uh, we'll be ready to talk about uh, cyber attack detection and cyber attack response. Okay, so much of this class is actually building the foundations to start understanding how to model uh, cyber attacks on autonomous systems. <clears throat> so you have, uh, so I'll, uh, like I mentioned, you know, people are talking about autonomous vehicles, people have been talking about it for a while now. And if you look at it, vehicles, vehicles have a lot of different networks. Uh, there is controller area network, CAN network, this book, the car hacker's handbook goes in depth about the CAN protocol and how do you hack the CAN protocol. Uh, <clears throat> there is an Ethernet network that is now coming up uh, in order to be able to send large media files from one place to another within the vehicle. Uh, for instance, you can have a camera right here and you might have a GPU in the back and the camera needs to send the information to the GPU. So then again, some sort of networking is needed in order to send that information to the GPU. Uh, we have a lot of other newer, uh, somewhat different uh, networking modules in the vehicle. Uh, some of it is driven by the use case, like I said about camera sending information to GPU for making real-time decisions. Some of it could be due to the entertainment system. So infotainment system in cars are becoming more complicated. If you go and buy a $35,000 car today, uh, you will find screens in the back and those screens can stream any movie. In fact, both, both screens can stream two completely different movies. So if you want to create those kind of experiences for the customers, then you need to have a completely new networking layer within the car because the existing layers cannot support those kind of functional, functionality. Now, you might want to connect them to internet so that you can stream Netflix in one of them and Amazon Prime in another one of them. And once you connect it to the internet, then you open it up to hackers to hack into the system and then cause problem. Now, <clears throat> typically if you have only, if, if your entertainment system is a network in itself and a hacker hacks into it, that's not a problem. But if that interfaces with the braking system or that interfaces with the engine system, then the hacker can also get access to the engine or the braking system and that could create havoc on the highway. So those are the things that as uh, cybersecurity engineers, we all have to worry about. And we all have to make decisions, very complicated decisions uh, about uh, how to design these systems, how to make sure that they are separate or what should be the point interface point B so that you don't inadvertently cause any damage to the system or potential damage in the case of a cyber attack. Uh, if you look at the critical infrastructure networks such as power systems or sewage system or uh, uh, water treatment systems, uh, these are all called critical infrastructure networks because our life depends on it. Uh, if you look at university for instance, I don't know how many of you are aware but university has a hot, hot steam pipe and a cold, I don't know, cold water pipe or something all over the place and whenever our building needs to be heated or cooled down they need to send some of that cold water slash hot air throughout this system. Uh, so all of this is very complex infra critical infrastructure system. In fact, in university, there are some labs where the temperature has to be maintained very precisely, especially those are bio uh, biology labs. So you need to make sure that you don't make any, uh, even under cyber attack, those things work as intended and um, and so, so uh, 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 what I meant was that in, in these cases also there is a lot of data that is getting passed around from here and there. Uh, some of them are connected to the internet and uh, then it creates a vulnerability and those vulnerabilities can be exploited to cause damage to the system. And the reason why I'm saying this is there are many case studies that have shown uh, what those damages could be, and I'll show you a few of them in the subsequent slide. Um, as we know, in the case of vehicles, automation is increasing. Uh, there is, uh, you know, there is old old cars where there was no automation. The driver has to perform all the tasks, including uh, changing the gear and uh, taking a lot of actions on the road. Uh, 
uh, steering and all that was there was no power steering at all, so you had to really steer the vehicle with your hand. Uh, now the vehicle is controlled by the driver, but some, some driving assist features may be included in the vehicle design, uh, which means that you might have power steering, you might have some some sort of uh, assistance features for the driver. Um, then you have partial automation. Uh, you can have something like an adaptive cruise control. You can have uh, some lane keeping assist systems and so on. You have uh, conditional automation. So technically, uh, in this case, the driver must be ready to take control of the vehicle at all times without with, uh, with a proper notice. So Tesla's automation system, uh, what they call it, autopilot or whatever they call it. Uh, that would be conditional automation because the driver is supposed to be responsible for any bad things that happen on a Tesla vehicle. Uh, so, but they claim that they can drive on a highway completely autonomously, um, yet we know about a few accidents that have happened in those situations. And high automation means that the driver uh, may have the option to control the vehicle. So there is steering, there is braking and all that, but the driver may choose to control it, may choose not to control it. And full automation means that the driver doesn't have to control it all. The vehicle will take care of itself under all circumstances. Full automation is extremely hard and uh, not sure how to explain it, but you know, a human driver like me, I can drive in Alaska, I can drive in Florida, I can drive in coastal region, I can drive in dense forests. I have that intelligence. Right, and so it's like all the human drivers have that intelligence, not just me. But when you talk about full auto, full automation, it's not very clear whether a vehicle that can drive in Alaska in like peak winter season with lots of snow on the road will also be able to drive in Florida, and will also be able to drive on California one, uh, which is a highway right next to the ocean. So it's very difficult to know uh, whether the full automation will be there or not there. Certainly you can have some sort of automation within a restricted scenario. For instance, you can have autonomous buses on airports, which is shuttling you from one, one terminal to another. But whether you can have complete, uh, complete automation, you just pick that bus from the airport and send it to Alaska and then it starts driving in Alaska. I'm not sure if that is possible or not possible. But one trend is that there is more and more automation happening in today's world. So here is a, a video that I want you to see. It kind of explains what the future looks like. We are building the world's most advanced roads. Cabins are dedicated lanes that enhance connected and autonomous transportation making travel faster, safer, and more accessible. Our infrastructure will enable vehicles to talk to each other. Cabin will improve how vehicles collectively perceive and react to their environment. Cabins optimize public transit with the efficiency of dedicated corridors. Let it be travel safely, quickly, so that was the future of road uh, they are imagining a future i mean the future looks really good but i worry about that future because it adds so many vulnerabilities in the critical uh, road network in this case <clears throat> So which all places can be attacked uh, in, a, in a, such an autonomous system? So this is typically what you would have studied in 3551 or any other feedback control class. So you have a set point. Uh, you have a controller that looks at the difference between the set point and the actual feedback signal. So the set point, for instance, in this room, the set point is 72 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature sensor is going to send the feedback signal that it's 71 degrees Fahrenheit right now. And then the controller on the basis of this difference between the set point and the actual temperature, it's going to take an action, <clears throat> send the signal to the actuator, 
the actuator, which in this case is the air handling unit, it's somewhere, somewhere above the ceiling. The air handling unit is deciding how much cold air to pump through each of these four uh, vents. So the actuator is going to make a decision. Okay, I mean, actuator doesn't make a decision. Controller makes a decision, sends the signal to actuator. The actuator is going to implement that command. And then the process, which is this particular room, will have a temperature evolution, which is dependent on how many people are in the room, whether we have a heat source in the room or not. For instance, this computer is a heat source in this room. And then uh, uh, how much cold air is coming in. And maybe the do door is open and there are people coming in, going out and all that stuff. So a lot of that stuff is going to affect the process, influence the process. And this sensor will again take the feedback signal and send it to the controller and so on. Now you can think about various places where an attacker can attack this particular system. So let's start with the sensor. How do we attack a sensor? So there is a temperature sensor in this room. Is there an easy way to attack that temperature sensor? If you wanted to attack the sensor, what would you do? Tamper it. Sorry? Tamper it. Yeah, you can tamper it, but uh, I want you to do a bit more non-intrusive attack. You can just go and press your hand in front of that temperature sensor and now your body temperature is what 98, 99 degrees Fahrenheit and so the temperature sensor is now reading 98, 99 degrees Fahrenheit and saying this room is very, very hot, start sending a lot of cold air into this room, right? So that's an attack, a very easy attack, right? So that's why they have a casing on that sensor so that you can't just go and put your hand. But you know, I mean, I think I can take out the casing and I can put my hand and make this room colder than what it is. Now the sensor is sending the information to the controller and if this particular network is susceptible to an attack, then I can attack that particular network. So even though you're not attacking the sensor, you're not putting your finger on the sensor, you can actually change the feedback signal itself, uh, which is getting fed into the controller. At the controller, typically controller is a microcontroller, it could be a computer, it could be a microcontroller, it could be some sort of Arduino, which is running some operating system, some processes, some logic. And if those logic is connected to the internet, you can go and replace that logic. You can do some sort of attacks on that computing system and you can change the logic in the controller. Uh, you can send, you can attack the control signal that is being sent to the actuator. So if there is a, there must be a wire going out from this particular thermostat to the air handling unit and you can go and tamper with that particular wire. If that wire was connected to the internet, you can go and change the signal that is going to the actuator. If the controller is taking information from other places, then you can uh, influence the information that the controller is getting. So in the case of radar in the car, the radar is uh, getting information from outside, from the surrounding. And you can actually change the information in the surrounding to the controller and that can cause an attack. So again, to give you an easy example, let's say you are driving a vehicle on the road um, and I put a mirror in front of you, right? And that's an attack because I'm changing the perception about the, like I'm attacking the controller itself, the information that is getting fed to the controller, I'm changing that. Okay, so these are the various places where uh, the system can be attacked. And now, if you have a medical device, I'm sure many of you will go to a medical device company, you might go to a critical infrastructure company, you might go to a water treatment plant, you might go to a, a data center, right? So data center is a huge uh, complex autonomous system as well. Uh, you will have to figure out what all can be attacked, right? And then based on what all can be attacked, you will have to come up with an algorithm, a response algorithm for making sure that your system will be secure against any of these attacks. That will be your full-time job in those companies. So here I will show you an attack that was... This was an attack done by Department of Homeland Security back in 2006 or 7, I think 2007. That's the date right here. And this is a defunct generator. The generator doesn't work um, at that point of time. So DHS said that, you know, this is a working generator. Why not just attack it and see where we can, what kind of harm we can cause. So they attack this and you will soon see that they destabilize the generator and it blew up basically. 
Yeah, so that's destabilization of the system through cyber attack. It's not a physical attack, and that was the biggest learning from DHS video, that this is very much possible just by sitting remotely and knowing a lot about the generator and just causing an attack to destabilize the generator. Uh, there has been uh, control of ships via false GPS signals. So GPS signals are also easy to spoof. So this was uh, done by UP Austin researchers. Um, then, of course, uh, in power systems, you can, uh, uh, by attacking the, the GPS clocks, you can cause oscillation in the power system. So um, that's also bad for power systems in that case. And so you, you can see, like, you're not really attacking like, uh, this is like attacking a GPS clock. This is attacking the GPS signal. It's not something you can see and feel. It's just something that is happening in the background and it's causing uh, issues in real world. And the problem is when you see the issue in the real world, you might be thinking, why, wh where is this happening? Like, what is the reason for this happening? Whenever there's an attack happening on the system, you wouldn't know because all of this is happening in the, at the cyber layer, not at the physical layer. This is a video, a simulation done by an OSU uh, PhD student where he's trying to spoof the radar signal. Uh, so this is the autonomous vehicle. That's a vehicle driven by a human being. And there is an attacker who's uh, trying to spoof the radar signal of this autonomous vehicle. So that blue vehicle stopped, but the radar did not get that information that the blue vehicle has stopped. The human driven vehicle has stopped. So it kept going. Uh, this is a widely reported attack back in 2015. Uh, they are the authors of this book. Uh, so they have basically, uh, uh, this is a Grand Jeep Cherokee. And uh, this was this was in uh, St. Louis. These attackers were sitting in Texas. And they were able to remotely send the, attack the vehicle because the infotainment system of the vehicle was connected to the braking and the steering system. So they, they hacked the infotainment system, sent the command to the steering and the braking system to stop the car, go get into some other lane. And in this case, uh, they overpowered the driver. So in some sense, the driver was trying to control the vehicle, but he just could not because the signals were being sent through the infotainment system, to the steering system to drive in this direction. And the driver couldn't do anything, despite him being in the vehicle. This, this is the driver. He's the driver and he's Andy Greenberg. He's the author of this particular article. So one question that a lot of people might have, uh, and people will ask you these questions also in whichever company you go to, how is an attack different from a fault? So I have a vehicle and I've had uh, faults all the time. There is some tire that got punctured, there's some oxygen sensor that went bad. Uh, something or the other, some or the other problem continues to happen to the vehicle, right? So that's called a fault, right? What's the difference between fault and an attack? How do you differentiate between fault and an attack? Yes. An attack has to be delivered. Right? It has to be delivered, exactly. And it is caused with some intention. A fault doesn't have any intention associated with it. There is some physics involved, maybe some <clears throat> uh, maybe the temperature was high, maybe there were some nails on the road and there is no intention associated with, uh, with the fault. But when, when you have an attack on the system, there is a deliberate intent to attack the system. And it's very difficult to know what the intent is. Or I, So think about it from this uh, perspective. So the university has a very sophisticated building energy management system. What would be the intent of an attacker to attack OSU's building energy management system, right? We don't know what the attacker's intention is going to be. It, it's very difficult. And if we don't know the intent of the attacker, we don't even know how to secure the system. If we knew that this is the attacker's intention, this is how he or she is going to attack, we can actually come up with safeguards to prevent that from happening. But right now it's not like, uh, there's no way to know the intent and that's why 
actually OSU's uh, building energy management system has one of the best cyber security for in the country and they have made sure that the energy management system is completely separated from the internet. So actually the only way to attack OSU's building energy management is to actually physically attack it. Uh, you can't really attack it remotely because they have just completely separated the, the network which is controlling the energy management to the network that is like the internet. And so there is no remote monitoring, there is no remote, like all of that remote thing is happening but it's within the university campus. So you really have to get access to the room where all of this is happening uh, in order to attack the system. So typically the traditional fault, so fault is a very old concept, right? So there were machines back in 1700s, 1800s, and they used to have fault and people needed to figure out how to fix that fault, right? So uh, it's a fairly old uh, technology. So you first come up with uh, what are the different hazards, then you come up with a plant and fault modeling. So what is the system equation for the plant? What is the model? for the plant and how exactly is the fault influencing the model of the plant. Then you come up with a diagnostic strategy. How do we know that a fault has occurred? How do we know if the pressure of the tire is lower than 33 or 34 PSI? Uh, then, there is, uh, then you do some MATLAB simulations with model in the loop, then you do software in the loop, then you do hardware in the loop, then you do calibration on actual vehicles. So this is from a vehicle's perspective. And then you do actual validation in vehicle. So there's a whole set of steps you need to do in order to detect, uh, in order to detect a fault and in order to mitigate the operation. So if my tire gets punctured while I'm driving the vehicle, the vehicle is not going to blow up, right? But, uh, however, the vehicle becomes very difficult to control. So I'm not sure if, has any of you seen a truck whose tire has punctured while the truck is in motion? I don't know if any of you have seen it. You've seen it, right? <coughs> it's very difficult to control the truck when the truck is driving at 75 miles an hour and the tire punctures, one of the tire punctures for the truck. I have seen it. I, I was right next to the truck. I was overtaking the truck while the truck had that issue. So I, uh, I've seen it from firsthand, you know, how difficult it is. However, it is up to the truck's manufacturer to make sure to design the system in a way that even if one of the tire gets punctured, the truck doesn't start, you know, hitting the vehicles nearby, right? So that's the design decision that they needed to make when they designed the truck to begin with. So all of that is something that they need to do. And of course, in those cases, they also undergo extensive testing with all these hazards so that they are assured that nothing bad is going to happen to the driver or to the vehicles nearby when the fault happens. Now, when you have cyber attack, uh, none of this changes. The only thing that changes is you, in, in addition to having a plant model, you need to have an attack model. And in order to have a diagnostic strategy design, you need to have a detection and mitigation strategy design. Okay, so, uh, so all of that needs to be designed at the very beginning, at the time when you are designing the vehicle, at the time when you are designing the system. Uh, we'll have three case studies during the class. Uh, these case studies will be in the form of an assignment. Uh, we'll study a denial of service attack on an adaptive cruise control algorithm. Uh, we'll study a spoofing attack on a chemical plant and we'll uh, study a servicing attack on a distributed web server system. Um, by the end of the course, uh, you will be able to understand how to model feedback control system and the attack. Uh, you will differentiate between various different types of attack. Uh, you will divide detection, attack detection strategies and attack mitigation strategies. Uh, once again, mitigation strategies are not general purpose. It is very specific. So it will, the mitigation strategies will be more like case studies. Detection strategy will be more general because there are lots of uh, general purpose tools you can use to uh, mitigate, uh, to detect uh, cyber attack. So that ends the, uh, this particular lecture. I just want to ask you one question. If you were to engineer, re-engineer this car, what would you do? Sorry? Yes, that's exactly what they did. So now the infotainment system is completely separated from the 
CAN system, which is actually controlling the internal processes within the vehicle. So sometimes, uh, you know, when you think about it, sometimes you might say, oh, what is the algorithm I can use to prevent this attack from happening? But many a times the solution is much simpler, just separate the network. As simple as that. Uh, why, why does it, uh, why would people not want to do it? Purely because of cost reasons. Maybe it's going to cost another $500 to add more uh, hardware so as to be able to, uh, yeah, to, to be able to separate it. But, uh, but once the government makes the regulation that the vehicle needs to be tail safe, even in the case of cyber attack, uh, the company will have to invest that money and pass on that cost to the consumer. So anyways, this is the cyber security is a fascinating field. If you go and talk to any company, they don't have any problem. If you go and work in the company, you will start seeing all kinds of problems. Hopefully you can tell me what those problems are five, 10 years from now. <laughs> but, uh, but it's a very fascinating field. It is a field that is driven by compliance. So as cyber security standards are being set, so as we speak, actually the cyber security standards for medical devices are being set. So one or two years later, the medical devices will have their own cyber security standards. So pacemakers, um, all kinds of uh, medical devices used in ICU, all of them will have a cyber security standard because all of them are kind of sort of uh, out in the open, like people can access them through the internet. So, um, so we'll see the government building compliance uh, and regulations around the uh, uh, cyber security and then we'll see a lot of uh, uh, a lot of jobs appearing in this particular broader area of securing autonomous systems because people understand cyber security kind of sort of because it's an old field but that is more related to database security that is more related to uh, securing information so this particular computer must be encrypted, the hard drive on this computer must be encrypted and all that stuff. So those are the things that we've already figured out. What we have not yet figured out is how to secure autonomous systems. And that's something that is still ongoing. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we'll see you, we'll see each other on Friday then. <laughs>